Inside episode 26 on Outsourcing Life, I reveal to you 12 outsourcing blunders and how you can avoid them. Also, inside the quick tip, I'll share with you one of the best shopping cart softwares I've used with WordPress. Now, check out the new intro. Welcome to the Outsourcing Life Podcast. And now, your host, Tyrone Shum. Hey, hey, and welcome to the next Outsourcing Life Podcast. Very, very excited today because I'm going to be answering one of the questions that one of our listeners, Ken Bergen, has left in a question. And it was actually a very, very smart idea and very cool question to ask. So I thought, let's put together a really cool podcast for that. So thank you so much for that, Ken. Now, before I jump into this today, I do want to just give you a quick update of what's been happening on Outsourcing Live. I've just sent out a monthly report onto the Outsourcing Live. So you'll probably see that recent post there. You can check it out at outsourcinglive.com and you'll see that. And we've had an amazing double digit growth again for the last month. So the month of November from November 1st to November 30th, we've just double digit growth again for our traffic and also podcasts, YouTube and just organically. And also too, some very exciting news is that we're on number one page for the Google Google.com for the keyword term outsourcing, ranked number eighth at the moment. So you can check that out. And that means that there should be more traffic coming through to the Outsourcing Live blog. Now, if you haven't been following the journey that I've been doing on this, you can also see it out there. There's a live personal case studies tab on Outsourcing Live and you can see my journey there working with my team to increase our ranking for that. And it was just a little challenge I started back in about June and our goal was to aim for first place, or not first place, first page of Google for the keyword term outsourcing within three months. I didn't achieve that but since then I've continued to do that and we've just consistently been implementing our backlinking strategy and guess what? After six months, we're there on the first page so it's fantastic to see. All right, that's the first thing I wanted to share with you in terms of update and news. The next thing I've done recently as well is made an announcement out to subscribers. So if you're not on my list, definitely hop on to Outsourcing Live and subscribe there. And I know I'm sort of just uh, encouraging you to take a lot of action right now, even before the podcast has started. But if you want to keep following up to date with all the tips and information that I share with you and with only those subscribers on there because you do get exclusive material on there, should definitely subscribe. I made an announcement that I like to go for aiming to get 30 reviews for iTunes in this month. So my goal is is 30 reviews. And so far we've had numerous reviews come onto our site or I should say onto this podcast and I really have to thank you for all those people who have left it. And I want to encourage and and ask if you if you like this podcast and you have been listening to it for quite some time, please please come over and leave a review for me. Now, I know that some people find it a bit challenging to do it because they don't know how and I can totally understand. So what I've done is I've created a step-by-step tutorial showing exactly what to do and easily just follow it. It's like a two-minute video clip which should only take you like maybe a minute to implement and you can access that at reviews.outsourcinglive.com. I'll repeat that again. It's reviews.outsourcinglive.com. And watch that video and then follow the instructions there and I'll give you the exact link on how to do that to add a review on iTunes. And I want to just thank you so much for upfront. Now, on to the reviews. I thought this would be cool. Share with you who's left a review. And the first one comes from Ken Bergen. He says, Tyron shares great content in each podcast, full of practical ideas and interviews with top operators, very generous. I've had to extend my morning walk to take it all in. That's excellent, Ken. Thank you so much for that review. Also, I've got one from D3CK5. Tyrone's podcast is extremely informative and well-produced. His quick tips have saved my business hours of research and his down-to-earth nature makes listening to his podcast extremely easy. Highly recommend to anyone thinking of outsourcing or running a small business in general. Sweet. Thanks so much for that. And then finally from uh, Stephen. We've got Tyrone's podcasts are easy to listen to as he's well-spoken and a great communicator. Great content and valuable information if you want to learn how to outsource. Sweet. Thank you so much for these amazing reviews and I really, really appreciate all your support. You as my listener and subscriber, I really value every single comment and the more feedback, the more reviews that you can give to me and to put down onto the iTunes, the more I can help improve this show and make it the best ever for outsourcing. So really amazed at all these reviews and thank you, thank you so much again. 
All right, let's jump into today's segment on what I'm going to be sharing with you. And as I mentioned, this was recommended by Ken, who's also left a review for me. And he listened to one of my recent podcasts about uh, outsourcing lessons learned from offline and online businesses. And it was really interesting because I had two women on that podcast to share, and that was episode 23. Sorry, episode 24, I should say. And inside the episode 24, they shared a lot of their experiences on how to outsource dealing with both an offline business such as an SEO company and also an online business which is dealing with a virtual assistant company. You can check that out over there. And he came back with a question asking if I could talk about the 12 outsourcing blunders and also how to avoid them. So the topic for today is talking about the 12 blunders or outsourcing blunders and how to avoid them. Now, depending on time, I think I'm going to have to split this one up into two parts because 12 outsourcing blunders is quite a lot because I'm going to go and share with you in detail on how I've gone with it. So, more than likely, I will probably split this up into two parts and I will probably talk about the first part right now which is the top six or the first six and then in next week's episode, I'll definitely be sharing with you the final six. All right, now let's jump into it. The reason why I think this is a great topic to talk about outsourcing blunders or to really share with you on that and how you can avoid them is you can learn from my mistakes. Therefore, you don't need to go through these kind of problems or hopefully minimize the chances of having these problems within your own business for outsourcing because the faster you can get up and running and to get your work outsourced, the less chances of you really stumbling and wasting time really and that way you can get your business moving much faster and make money much quicker too. And as I've said in the past, this is not really a make money business or blog or podcast but the main goal for me is to show you and share with you my experiences on how to outsource and how to make it effectively for your business. All right, the first one is the first outsourcing blunder I wrote down is not paying your outsource on time. When my first started, yes, I think everyone makes that mistake. I didn't pay my first outsource on time. And the reason behind that is because I had this mindset thinking, okay, if I pay them after they've actually completed the job, which is usually the case, I usually wait about seven days because just in case anything happens, then I could get that fixed up. And therefore, that person will be in debt to me to be able to fix that thing up without me paying. And if they don't fix it up, I won't pay them. That's how I had my mindset. It was actually the wrong mindset because what happens is that People in the Philippines, for example, the people who I recommend to outsource to, they really, really rely on this income. And because I delay the income, it actually made them upset. Now, they won't say anything, they won't tell you why, but from what I gathered and from experience of dealing with outsourcers in the Philippines, uh, they don't like to be paid late because, as I said, their family relies on this, their livelihood relies on this, and it's not the best thing. And you're not setting yourself a good example because if you don't pay your staff on time, it means that the rest of your staff or the rest of the people who you hire down the track will get a bad reputation about you and they won't like you. And you don't want that because they're here to work with you and they're, they're here to also help you grow your business. And as time progresses, as you build a larger team, the more you'll need to make sure that you manage your pay system much better. And that's what I've learned over the past. So make sure that's the first thing you pay them on time because it's a crucial part and it helps you run your business better. And one other thing I can probably give you is to give them a bonus whenever you can. Not necessarily every month but maybe at least once every six months reward them with something. So that way they can be encouraged to continue to work with you and stay with you for long term. And that's what's happened with my team. They've just stayed with you for many, many years already. That's the first one. Second outsourcing blunder is giving them instructions that were not specific and blaming them for delivering the wrong result. This one is a very common one, particularly when I speak to a lot of the students inside the Mass Outsource Mastermind course. They come back to me and say, on the webinar time, my, my particular person that I've hired, for example, a web developer, has said to me, yes, we can do all this work and then they come back to you and give me the wrong delivery results so they may not get the website done properly the way that you wanted them to do and also to not come back with the right result. And that's really frustrating because I have gone through that many times, particularly when I first started outsourcing to people in India. I 
had a lot of communication issues and even when I did specifically draw on diagrams and send specific tasks written out in very, very clear instructions, I found that it was a very, very bad way to communicate with them because they didn't find that they could understand me. And I'm not saying the method I used was perfect and I didn't and I'm not saying the method that I did was right exactly as well. So what I found was it's one due to communication and that's where you need to make sure that you hire someone who has fluent English and that's very, very crucial. And two, that they actually understand where you're coming from because there are going to be cultural differences and I can guarantee you if you're hiring someone from a country that doesn't really understand the cultural differences in the Western society compared to their own society, then you're going to have a struggle. Now, the reason why I always recommend hiring or outsourcing to Philippines is because they have been raised up in a very strong United or Western society, particularly from the United States culture, from the American culture, I should say. And that's the reason why it's so easy to work with them because they understand and they've been raised up with that kind of uh, skill set and also with that kind of education, sort of ingrained into them. And majority of them do have degrees. So they are very, very well skilled and very well trained. Now, how do I avoid this or how would you avoid this taking it forward and how to make sure that you don't have issues with regards to getting work done properly and on time? The one thing that I highly recommend is to make sure that you do send over to them a video of exactly what you want to be done. That definitely makes it very clear and makes it very uh, straight to the point that, that this is what you want to do, particularly for websites or particularly for any tasks that require a lot of visual, I would highly recommend you send them to a video. And a free software that I recommend to use is called Jing Project, which you can download at jingproject.net or project.com, sorry. That particular software is available for both the PC and also for the Mac. And you can use that at any time to be able to capture the screen, draw on it, do whatever you want with it, and then send over also an audio component with that video saying to them, this is what you need to do, this is how you go about changing it. And that way, when they receive it, they can see exactly the visual link of what needs to be done. Now, it's very easy because once Jing captures your video, it'll create a link for you, which you just send that one link and your outsourcer just clicks on it and looks at it and basically just takes a hold of the task. And I do this literally every time I have a task. In, in addition to that, to make sure that things are clear, make sure you specify in either your task that you're sending over to them, the websites that are related to it, any particular points that they need to be aware of and specify anything else that needs to go with the task. For example, if I'm talking about web development and I need links to be changed, I'll make sure I give them the exact links and the titles that I want to be changed. That way, it saves one, time and two, less confusion so they don't have to think about what they need to do, they just need to implement. And that would probably be the best way to resolve and make sure that you don't have that issue down the track. So that's the second one. The third blunder that I've come across in terms of outsourcing is not setting a deadline or time frame. This is a huge one because it's very easy for them to just get the work and you expect them to do it. But the thing is, sometimes if your virtual assistant doesn't know the task well, is relatively new to any of the work that you've just given them, then there's a great chance that they won't know when it's due. So you've got to make sure that whenever you're sending one task over or, or a specific project, you do set a, a specific time frame for them to follow. In doing that, that will make life a lot easier for you and also too for them because at the same time, they're going to make sure that they deliver and time out that particular project or that task in the correct time. I know that in a past when I've had projects in for particularly web development because we do have a web development arm for my business is that I'll find that sometimes these projects go over the top. It goes literally, I don't know, a week or two over delay its, its specific budget. And the way I've had to overcome that or to overcome that is to one, firstly, upfront buffer the time in. So I add usually an extra 20% of extra time on top of the project just in case because that way you can make sure you deliver the project on time. And even if there are delays, you've still got that 20% buffer. That's the first thing. Second thing is that I make sure that when I speak to my project developer who works on this particular project that he will scope out the correct time. What I'll get him to do is that he'll sit there 
and list out exactly how long will each task take within that project and then from there, send it back to me. If he doesn't do that properly, then I hold him responsible because as I've mentioned in the past, in, the, in other podcast episodes, you need to set boundaries for these things. If they don't get the task completed on time, then unfortunately for them, they're going to not get paid on time and that affects their salary and they'll know that because they, as I said, they really, really rely heavily on their particular salary and without that salary, which is their livelihood, they can't get things done. So by setting these boundaries and setting these uh, in, things to get in place, you'll make sure that your uh, projects get done on time and it's very, very important for that to happen. So that's the third thing and I highly recommend with that particular one, you can specifically specify deadlines for tasks as well. So if it's a two-day task that has to be completed by a virtual assistant, specify that. Now, there's an easier and faster way. You don't have to do this in an email. In Basecamp, for example, if you're using a project management system that I recommend, for example, make sure that you just do specify a time because it allows you to select the date and send that task over to them. And then once they've done that, make sure they tick that off so that it's been completed. Otherwise, you won't know if it's done. <laughs> yeah, so that's the third thing that I've found with the with outsourcing blunder there. The fourth blunder that I've come across in outsourcing blunder is keeping them on for too long when you should have fired them or let go of them much earlier. This is a very, very common thing and a lot of people do this. And it is something, it's a mindset and also too a frustration because one, you spend a lot of time looking for this person and you hope that this person will be the one. Unfortunately, there are going to be times that don't work out as, as it expects. So you need to be prepared to have an exit strategy. And a lot of us, even myself, I've had this issue before, is I don't didn't have an exit strategy. Nowadays, I know exactly what I'm looking for and I know how I can terminate the person quickly and fast. So that way, I don't have a loss of opportunity for the next person to come in and take over. Now, I'll give you an example of this. I hired a web developer and as you'll probably notice, I, I hire quite an, I've always been hiring web developers because we need them for developing our websites. You know, that's what we do for our clients and we also do search engine optimization for our clients which is SEO services. Uh, so, what I've done is I've hired web developers and this one particular web developer was reasonably good at what he did uh, for PHP and I did pay a little bit extra for him because I thought he'd be a good programmer. I thought that he'd be a, a star programmer because from his portfolio, he showed that he had a lot of strong skills in the particular programming skill that I hired him for. But when it did come to the time where I need him to do the work and get it done on time, unfortunately, the work was kept getting delayed because he was still learning about how to use this system that we're implementing. And yes, I did give him a quite a big challenge but in comparison to my first programmer because I remember training up my first programmer, my programmer learned how to implement that software and use that software within a month. This particular person took almost two months to learn everything that I tried to train my first programmer to do and I think they probably this person that I hired which I paid a lot more money for, he had even more skill set apparently in his uh, resume and CV. So I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm paying a little bit more and I'm happy to do that as long as I can get results fast. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. And I, being the person I am, I usually give people a little bit more leniency and choice, or not choice, a chance. And by giving him that chance to improve and hopefully implement and get everything done within say that period of time that I gave him, I was expecting him to do something better and sort of wow me and to really come over on top. Fortunately, that didn't happen. So after about the third month, that's when I decided I've got to terminate this person and move forward. So what I'm basically saying is for that one month that I really hesitated and not and just sort of give, given this person a chance, I should have gone out and started to find another person quickly so that I don't have that loss of opportunity cost because one, I had projects to be delivered to a client and unfortunately, we delayed that project because the client didn't receive it on time and that was also partly because of my programmer who couldn't get it done on time and I was expecting too much from him and as a project uh, kept going on, I, I ended up taking accountability and responsibility having to, to manage the process again and change it. So what I would say to you as a lesson to learn from this is if you do find that 
things are not going well, within at least the first month or two, don't hesitate and firstly question why this is not going well and give them one chance to try. If it's after the first chance, things are still not going well and you can't change it, then all comes back down to either their skill set, they're not skilled enough in this or proficient enough in this area that they've been hired to do or they're just plain lazy and I know that uh, I'm saying really bluntly and directly about it but it is true. Some of them that I've seen before have been like that. I'd highly just recommend terminate them, change all your passwords for them and just move on forward quickly as you can because that will definitely save you a lot of headache and also too, you won't lose out on so much of your opportunity costs because you could potentially hire someone much better who will get the work done much faster. And that's what I found. Straight after I terminated this person, I did find someone much better and just did a fantastic job and still is still on my team as well. So that's why I learned from that lesson. You don't know this until you do go through it and it was a painful two months after the first month of hiring him and I thought giving him all that training and supporting him all the way, I, I thought I could really change him and get him to become what I wanted him to be for my team but unfortunately, that didn't happen. And also too, just letting you know, I'm not saying this happens in all cases, not necessarily every person uh, will actually be skilled up or professional in that sense that they are going to get paid more. So because I pay, I thought I paid a little bit more, I'll get the right person and also too that they'll have the experience and skill. But unfortunately, that doesn't always come out to be the case. So make sure that you do when you do discuss with people or you are looking to hire, don't just look at the price but just look at as well their skill set and even if you do think that you're paying a little bit more, you're going to get better result, it doesn't always happen to be that case. It comes back down to their skills and whether or not they can complete the task and deliver a result on time. All right, so that's the fourth one there in terms of how how that particular outsourcing blunder. That one for me is a bit challenging because I've had many times at least five or six times where I've gone through that sim similar issue and obviously, I thought after the second or third time, I would have learned but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it's a bit hard to tell because sometimes you're hiring people based on their skill set and if they're halfway through a project, it's very difficult to try and terminate them straight away and since then, I've put in systems and an exit strategy and that's the other thing I shouldn't mention. What is my exit strategy? My exit strategy is first warning, if warning isn't implemented and results change within a week, then I, I do go ahead and terminate. And even if the project's halfway through, I realize that it, you just have to cut your losses and move forward and find someone else quicker and get it implemented fast. Otherwise, you will probably have someone dragging on and the project won't get done. All right, so that's the fourth one. The fifth blunder is not doing a reference check on their previous employment. This is a big one. I personally have had issues when I didn't do this. I, I've, I've had a few times where I've had a referral and on maybe one out of the two referrals have been good so it hasn't been too bad but one of them didn't turn out well and I didn't do my reference checks. I didn't find out exactly what their history was from the previous employer. I didn't find out exactly what they did in the workforce how long had they been there and all that kind of stuff. And as much as their CV and resume had everything written down and I did the interview and that went well, I should have got a third person's point of view which was their previous employers and if I had done that, I would have been definitely rest assured that things would be fine. So I highly recommend if you don't do <laughs> reference checks, then it is going to be something that may come back to bite you down the track. And I'm just saying that out there because personally, I've had that issue. As an example, as an outsourcing example blunder here is I hired a virtual assistant who I knew just from a referral that they said that this particular person had great administration skills, very good in the corporate world and worked really well with a particular or their boss in the past and just from their works, I could see that they wrote really good articles but when it came down to administration work and understanding how all this internet marketing stuff and backlinking and all that came about, it was painstakingly painful to train them because they didn't understand the whole task and it, even though I had training videos there showing them step by step, this person didn't understand it unfortunately and un <laughs> it's just the fact of life that not everyone gets this kind of stuff. So, I had to make a decision and uh, terminate this person 
But if I had taken that step, I would not have actually hired this person based on the references because when I went back and checked on the references, I found out that this person was only very good at writing but just didn't have very strong administrative skills. And basically, they had a family and also a child and because of that, uh, that also affected their performance because uh, being a mother, she was spending more time looking after a child than they were spending time working in the business. And that's the reason why she also left her job and the other person had to let her go because of that as well. If I had done these reference checks properly, I think I would have at least minimized my chance and not had the same loss of opportunity cost. And that comes back down to again, making sure that you do do these checks. And I hope that from listening to my stories and learning from these lessons, you'll also implement these and not go through these same issues that I've had. Now, how do you go about these reference checks? Particularly for people who are living in the States, I know it's sometimes the time for differences you can't get hold of people in the Philippines at the same time because they'll be during the day and you'll be probably asleep. What I recommend you do is to send an email off to the employer and just ask them a few questions and more than likely they'll reply back because you just let them know that this is a reference check for so and so. And by doing that, you'll find out so much more about them from a third person's point of view because one, this employer has worked with them. They've seen their work progress, not based on their CV, but actual performance based at work. And, and thirdly as well, they can tell you what their personality is like at work, how they blend in with the rest of the work staff, are they always on time, are they prompt, etc., etc. So you'll find out a lot of these things which you won't find out in a resume because more than likely, this person will not tell you. So they want to tell you the best parts about them, but uh, you won't find out any of the other parts that you don't want to know. So, highly recommend reference checks and that's one of the blunders, outsourcing blunders that I've learned over, over the period of time that I've hired people and I hope with this, you can implement it or avoid any of these mistakes that I've made as well. All right, so that's the fifth outsourcing blunder. The final and the last outsourcing blunder that I want to share with you in this podcast is not, or oh, actually I should say hiring too many people at once and not being able to manage them together. Now, this is a big, big issue because if you're a medium-sized company and you do have a budget, it's great to go out and spend all that money to reinvest or invest the money into resources, whether it be human resources like hiring more people and outsourced or investing into equipment and software, which is very, very good because if you are looking to expand, then that's probably the way to go. But I don't recommend going and blowing all your money because it sounds great to do that but in terms of a bottom line and also managing a team or people, it's sometimes very, very challenging. Now, when I talk about hiring one person at a time, what I mean by is actually focusing on hiring that first A team player. Now, what do I mean by an A team player? An A team player is someone who has the senior or slash executive type of experience, someone who has had experience managing a business, someone who has that drive and that motivation to take over and look at it from a bigger picture of the business. Eventually, they will probably manage a team of staff that they hire for you but the ultimate thing when you first start out is to hire that person to be trained up so that one, they learn all the things that you have in your business and take over from what you currently do day to day. Basically, like a CEO but you're not paying this, the cost of a CEO's rate. So that's the first thing that you, you need to look at hiring is that A team player. Once you have that person in place, it makes it very, very easy. I shouldn't say very easy. It makes it strategically very promising for you to be able to grow your business much faster because once you have your right-hand man that's in place and they understand how it goes, let them do the hiring, let them do the training and allow them to manage your business because by then, hopefully they've trained up and understand your whole business process and all your systems and then that way, you can grow your team much faster. My biggest mistake in the past was to do everything myself. As an entrepreneur, it's very common. You know, Once I get that one task, I'll go ahead and do it myself and I keep forgetting to outsource it and that's why I, I have been very, very systematic with everything I've been doing. If it not, doesn't need to be do, done by myself, I'll outsource and get someone else to do it. So, what I'm just trying to say to you is when you are first hiring, don't go crazy with hiring 10 people, 20 people all at once. Not saying that you will but I know and I have heard of stories who have a budget, say five grand and they go, okay, I'm going to hire every one of these people, like 10 people for 500 bucks each which is a great deal 
But in terms of managing, in terms of running the processes, you're going to have a nightmare <laughs> doing that initially. So firstly, start off with the first 18 player. Once you get that person in place, then build up your systems, e.g. have a project management system, have the right procedures in place, then build on that. And that's the thing. If you have a look at, at previous things built in the past, if you're looking at like building a building, you have to have a blueprint in place. You take it step by step, stone by stone. You don't just go and put up a building and expect it all to be working. It's the same thing. You've got to build your team up. And I know it sounds like a very lengthy and long-term process and it is, but it will save you so much time down the track and I can guarantee you that just from my personal experience. So I highly recommend find that 18 player first focus on that one person and get them skilled up. Now, my virtual assistant who is pretty much my executive assistant, she's really literally known, learned everything in my business. I've allowed her to take over a lot of the things that I used to do and by now, she's really pretty much dealing with the rest of the team and that's why I'm able to trust in that particular person and hopefully, you know, she'll be promoted to manager sooner than later. And that's what I'm saying is that you need to find that right person and train them up and get them skilled up to that position. All right, so that's pretty much on that particular outsourcing blunder. I hope that sort of gives you an insight on how that can work and how you can improve on that and avoid any of the mistakes I've done. You know, learn from these, take it away. And if you do have any particular questions or not sure about how I've, how you've gone or how to handle these things, more than happy for you to leave a comment at, at uh, outsourcinglive.com on this episode which is episode 26 and if you leave those questions there, I'll be more than happy to reply and answer them for you and help you along the way. You know, if you've got any issues that you've come up with and anything that I've discussed here and you're not certain about, feel free to ask that. Now, as I said, there's 12 outsourcing blunders and how to avoid them. Today, I've gone through the first six. Next week's podcast, I'll be going through the final six. And let me just give you a little bit of a sneak peek of what you can expect for next six blunders because I think this will definitely help you and plan help you plan out what you could do. Some of the things that I'll be talking about is using the wrong service. That's a massive thing that I've had in the past. I don't know. Uh, commonly, I know that a lot of people go out to Elance, Odesk and stuff like that but using the wrong service can have a detrimental effect because you don't find that right candidate there. Uh, hiring the cheapest rate, man, that is a very big blunder. I went for the cheapest person when I first started because I thought outsourcing is going to be cheap, cheap, cheap. <laughs> so that's a huge, huge one that I'm going to talk about as well and there'll be many, many more to come. So remember, there's six outsourcing blunders which I'll share with you in the final part for next week and yeah, I'll definitely be going through in quite a bit of detail on how to avoid those and minimize the chances of you having that same mistake. All right, so if you've enjoyed this, uh, feel free to leave a comment as well down at Outsourcing Live as well. Remember, there's, there's a questions area which you can leave it down or comments area and ask me any questions about this particular one. And also, just want to remind you, as I said at the beginning, I'm trying to aim for 30 reviews on the iTunes podcast and I know that I've got hundreds and thousands of downloads already. Last month, we had over 7,000 something odd downloads so it means there are many, many hundreds of you listeners there and I love you just at least a few of you, a percentage of you to come over or all of you if you can to come over and leave a review and as I mentioned, the link to it is reviews.outsourcinglive.com and I'll go through in a two-minute video showing exactly how to leave a review if you don't know how to do one. All right, thank you so much for that. It's time for the Outsourcing Live Quick Tip. Recently, I've been considering setting up a specific storefront or shopfront for the Outsourcing Live website and I was looking at so many different options so that we, we can display all the products in either grid format or list format. And in the end, I had to go and set up really just a separate subdomain or separate WordPress site to be able to house all these products. Now, I do have a specific system in the in the back end called Fusion HQ, which runs and stores all our products and processes all the payments and stuff. But I didn't really have a very good interface for that because at the end of the day, I want to make your shopping experience when you are looking to purchase products from my site to be very easy and like an e-commerce store. And because I've developed e-commerce stores, I know exactly what I'm looking for. So I decided to go for a very easy to use and simple but clean WordPress shopping cart system 
which I'm recommending right now called Shopper Press. Now, if you want to check it out and you can download it, you can actually have a look at it from outsourcinglive.com forward slash shopper press and it's shopper spelled S-H-O-P-P-E-R and it's a beautiful theme. I have to say this is one of the most elegant and stylish but also simple WordPress shopping cart theme that I've seen around to date. Like I've reviewed numerous of them. I've seen done WP e-commerce, I've done eShop and all that and so far, nothing seems to can be, seems to beat this one in my opinion because it's just simple, clean and beautiful. And the great thing as well is that when you check this out, it's got a special discount right now. So if you have a look and you go through my link, you should be able to get it at that price. But also too, it comes with 20 different extra themes and that's really amazing because I didn't want to get stuck on just one theme that someone else has. So I checked that out and had a look and there's like themes from golf, uh, mobile phones, pretty much anything you could think of. So 20 different themes for you to style and change. But essentially, the reason why I chose this one is because I really like how easy it is to lay out and to be able to set up the shopping cart very, very easily. Basically, what I do is I load up the products. So create a new post, add the product and then I can add the price of it. I can add description. I can even add all the weight of the product if it's a physical product and then once I've done that, I just simply insert the link to where this product will be purchased. And because I have a system set up directly to use PayPal or maybe an affiliate link as well for some of the products, I can easily insert that. Whereas I haven't seen any other card out there allow me to do that because other cards I know for a fact is that you have to use their payment systems built into that. So ShopperPress has that flexibility for me to insert that. And ideally what I'm going to be doing is displaying however many, I might have like 50, 60 different products in there on outsourcing and video and also anything else that's related that I could recommend to look at and use and all you have to do is simply click on that and it will take you straight to that right link to purchase the product. So it's really at most two-step click and furthermore, there'll be descriptions and all that kind of stuff as well. So if you are interested in setting up your own shopping cart like how I'm doing, you can simply just go and purchase this particular plugin. Very, very affordable and it's very easy to use and very clean. You can get it at outsourcinglive.com forward slash shopperpress. Now, if you like more resources like this one, you can find them inside Mass Outsource Mastermind along with video tutorials and step-by-step -step instructions showing exactly how I use them. To get a 30-day no-risk trial membership to Mass Outsource Mastermind, simply visit freevideoset.com. Until next time, I wish you success in your quest for outsourcing.